Thank you uh, for being part of our journey to shed light on the sustainable solutions for peace. We live in a world where the most peaceful nations on earth continue to become more peaceful, while the least peaceful places continue to deteriorate. At a time where the peace and equality gap continues to grow, we have a responsibility to take action and reverse this trend. We reverse this trend by protecting human rights for all people. We must start by engaging in positive conversations to build mutual understanding and embrace the discomfort of learning and evolving. Each time we collaborate and grow together, we actively promote peace equality. Together for Peace is a global platform for agents of change from all walks of life. We generate conversations that motivate, educate, and activate our online community to cultivate peace solutions that care. Together, we will globally fill the gap to solve peace inequality. To fill the gap, we must not let polarizing ideologies overpower our humanity. We must not let the issues overpower our core values. We can make a collective decision for peace when, we, when each and every one of us allows our different views to enrich our discussions and find enlightenment. We must learn to work together with our differences to ensure a more just and peaceful world tomorrow. Now, let me introduce to you today's Together for Peace guest, Dr. Harry Anastasio. Dr. Harry Anastasio is a published author, distinguished professor, peace activist, and exceptional Rotarian. Between his trips, writings, and classes, Harry's compassion and loyalty to peace building is always clearly demonstrated through his work. Harry is a professor of international peace and conflict studies and former director of the conflict resolution program at Portland State University. His work focuses widely on nationalism, ethnic conflict, multidimensional peace building, and international peace and conflict issues. Harry has led peace globally. Not only is he the co-founder of the Rotary Action Group for Peace, Harry was appointed as an academic advisor and a mem and member to the Rotary Peace Center Center's Committee of Rotary International. He led peace building initiatives and facilitation in the Eastern Mediterranean, engaging Greek and Turkish citizens and policy leaders from Greece, Turkey, and Cyprus. Harry has been invited as a consultant by the Bureau of Intelligence and Research of the U.S. Department of State to assist in briefing newly appointed U.S. ambassadors to the Republic of Cyprus. Harry's multifaceted experience in conflict and peace has allowed him to make sense of the complex contemporary and historic social issues and transform them into insightful wisdoms. I have had the pleasure to get to know Harry over the years. No matter how many or how demanding my questions may be, Harry is always able to provide an answer that uplifts the human spirit through his um, thoughtful and compassionate, through his thoughtful compassion for others. You can always trust him to provide an analysis that guides you through the dark fog with the light of truth. It is no wonder that Harry is a poetician, a term that I have given him to describe Harry's calm poetic wisdom of messy political issues. Underneath the sophistication of Harry's analysis lies his intellectual humility. He is a tenured professor, but a driven lifelong student motivated by passion and curiosity for the truth behind peace. Today on Together for Peace, it is my utmost pleasure to share with you a virtual tea conversation with one of my favorite minds, Dr. Harry Anastasio. Welcome, Harry, to uh, the Together for Peace. So I want to start by, <laughs> I see you smiling. <laughs> yeah, this is, this is our virtual tea conversation. I, I, yeah. <laughs> um, so I want to start by um, asking about your upbringing. You are a fine mind for a reason, because you, you've experienced the world peace and conflict in many and multifaceted ways, um, starting even with your upbringing. So can you share with us um, how your upbringing enhanced or impacted your decision to seek peace in the world? 
Well, Green, first of all, let me thank you for the invitation. It's an honor to be here and to share a few thoughts with you. Uh, thank you very much for a rather flattering introduction. I hope I can live up to the standards <laughs> that you set in your description of me. Uh, but yes, uh, as far as my background is concerned, I was, I was raised uh, on the island of Cyprus. It's a very small island. Uh, especially compared with the United States. It's uh, just a little less than a million people. Uh, but it's, uh, it's an island that has experienced uh, turmoil, um, has been impacted uh, by global conflicts and regional conflicts. Uh, we can talk a little bit about them. But to give you a sense of my life's trajectory, starting from Cyprus, um, I have to start with the colonial era uh, because I did experience Cyprus and the British colonial rule. Uh, I experienced the insurgency uh, against British colonial powers at the time. I experienced independence from uh, colonization and soon after uh, an inter-ethnic conflict uh, that unfolded in very bloody ways. Uh, and has given us a political conflict that is still, uh, still has open wounds uh, to this day. Uh, even as we speak, there is some uh, escalation of tension in the Eastern Mediterranean connected to Greece, Turkey, and Cyprus. Um, I have also experienced uh, how you know, Cold War politics have impacted the island. Uh, and the life of the society, uh, and how local conflicts and international conflicts became so intertwined that they really crushed the society, uh, being so small and so vulnerable. And yet a society on an island <laughs> so beautiful with um, 360 days of sunshine <laughs> uh, surrounded by the blue Mediterranean, it's almost a contradiction. Uh, and then the next stage of my life was uh, uh, relocating to the States uh, based on an invitation I received from uh, Portland State, uh, which was really derived from the uh, peace work that I did in the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, and I have been here uh, since that time. And uh, if you want to break down each of these chapters, <laughs> we can proceed. <laughs> yeah. I definitely will not let you just escape with your uh, macro intro. <laughs> <laughs> so, Harry, I think um, you painted beautifully uh, the context in which you grew up. Um, and um, I love the, um, that you gave us an insight to the, the Mediterranean Sea and the sunshine. But under, under, that, uh, under those circumstances, there was also tragedies. Um, and uh, one of them, you've experienced yourself at your parents, uh, your father's cinema. Can you tell us that story that would unravel the, the human, um, how, how conflict impacts humanity directly? Uh, yes, well, the, my memories of the colonial era, you know, have multiple dimensions. Uh, uh, the one that I experienced most frequently were the checkpoints. As uh, I was, my dad would drive me from the village where I grew up to, you know, the nearby town. Uh, we had to stop at multiple checkpoints and, you know, the British troops would have us step out of the car and they had to, they had to uh, search the car uh, because at the time the insurgency was unfolding and everyone was the suspect. Uh, and obviously, part of the suspicion was uh, whether uh, my dad's car was carrying weapons from one area in the island to the other. Uh, and this was very frequent and we almost became, you know, habituated to it. Uh, but there was one incident that I would say marked my induction into uh, violent conflict. And it has to do with an incident that took place uh, in my father's uh, little cinema. Uh, he built the first uh, cinema in the village. Uh, but I, I want to caution our audience not to think of cinemas 
on the scale and glamour that we see them in the United States. This was a very, very simple structure with four walls, a projection room and a screen. And it was a kind of novelty. Uh, here it is, you can see it on your screen. Uh, we practically built that by hand with the builders at the time. Uh, and it was due to uh, start functioning. Uh, and it was really a novelty at the time in the village. It gives you a little bit, I think the photo gives you a little bit of a sense uh, of how basic everything was at the time. So I remember uh, sitting, my mom would sit at the cashier and my grandfather would be collecting the tickets and my father would be running the projection room. And I remember uh, going into the theater, uh, the movie uh, had started. I actually remember the name, it was a Greek love story, it was called The Red Roses. <clears throat> and I remember I sat one row, uh, one, uh, two, two rows behind the neighbor. Uh, the neighbor's name was Mr. Zanetos, and this particular gentleman, was an auxiliary policeman working for the British. Um, the paradox about this person was that uh, he, he was working for the British, but he ideologically he was communist. And the insurgency in Cyprus was started by the far right wing nationalists. And they targeted him as a traitor. So I was sitting watching the film and I saw four characters uh, who were not from our village. Uh, they came into the cinema and they sat between me and Mr. Zanetos, who was there with uh, his wife and his daughter. And about 15 minutes into the movie theater, I saw these four characters sitting between me and my neighbor. They bend over, they put on their hoods and they stood up and they pulled out their guns. They shot him right there. So it was very, um, a very shocking experience. Uh, panic set in, there were scream, people were screaming, people were shouting and then, and my mother rushed in to see if I was okay. She practically lifted me up physically. She rushed to one of the exit doors and practically knocked it down and threw me right out. <laughs> uh, within minutes, the British uh, military showed up. Um, the guy uh, that was shot was uh, taken to the uh, porch, to the veranda of the cinema. Uh, he was bleeding to death. People were shouting, you know, to take him to the hospital. Nobody wanted to touch him because they knew they would be the next target of the insurgency. The guy died. My father was arrested. My grandfather was arrested. Um, <coughs> they, spent, uh, uh, they spent time in jail because the suspicion by the British was that they were part of the plot. Uh, eventually, uh, they let him, them go, but uh, my mother tells me that uh, uh, father aged during that period. Now, the way it impacted me is very peculiar because after this incident, even though it was the talk of the village for years, uh, I did not remember a single thing. I was blank. I was a child at the time, about eight, nine years old. Uh, and I had no memory whatsoever of the incident until my late 20s. And I think this is indicative of how the mind protects us when we are incapable of dealing with trauma. So it all blanked out until I was ready to handle it, as it were. So in my late 20s, the memory came back and it was so clear, so vivid, <clears throat> I remember when the memory came back, I could practically smell the gunpowder and the sounds. I could hear the sounds uh, in a very crystal clear way. Uh, so that in short was my induction uh, into the violence of the time and everything that unfolded since. Wow. 
just a, it's really tragedy how just all the different camps of, of thinking and agendas um, seems that all these agendas are more important than human life and uh, it is it's uh, sad I'm sorry Harry for what you've experienced it's it's horrible um, that didn't end your struggle continued throughout the madness uh, when uh, tell us the story about the kebabs uh, that, <laughs> that yeah the, the that is a heartbreaking story it's, it's short but it's it just uh, is telling of the the era at the time and how conflict looked like like how you separated yes. from the British yes yes you uh, you remember the story so <laughs> I will share it. It, it I mean the story really has a lot to do with how we cope as children in a in a society that was you know conflict ridden and conflict habituated. Uh, I do remember playing a lot of war games as children. They were our games, and that was part of our socialization uh, into conflict. And I remember how we experienced it as natural, not as, as a problematic phenomenon that had to be reflected upon and addressed and resolved. Uh, but at the same time, we, we also had uh, innocent souls as we you know, passed our time and played in a carefree way. And I do remember that when the uh, independence came and the next, uh, the next violent conflict erupted, which was, you know, between Greeks and Turks. I should mention that during the colonial era, uh, which is um, not uncommon because colonialism and the, the uh, nationalist uh, hegemony that colonial powers brought into different countries and into different populations, uh, they bred a counter nationalism, a counter insurgent nationalism and a counter bellicose nationalism um, to, to counter uh, the colonial rule. In Cyprus, uh, we had two conflicted nationalisms, a Greek nationalism and a Turkish nationalism that had national ideals and national objectives that were quite contradictory. So as soon as the British left and Cyprus became independent, within three years, we had a constitutional breakdown and a lot of inter-ethnic violence. And part of that violence created uh, fierce and absolute segregation of the Greek and Turkish neighborhoods. And we as little children, I remember uh, we were disturbed and what, what disturbed us was not so much the conflict to which we were habituated, but the fact that uh, being members of the Greek community, we couldn't cross into the Turkish neighborhood uh, to buy a kebab because they made excellent kebab. And I remember how we reflected and tried to find ways to access the great kebab that the Turkish neighborhood used to make. So uh, we commissioned a friend who was Arab. He was neither Greek nor Turkish, he was Arab. So he could cross over to the Turkish neighborhood. So anytime we, <laughs> we were ready for kebab, we would uh, give him them and he would cross over to the Turkish side, buy the kebab and smuggle them over. And that's how we continue to have Turkish kebab, even though we lived in the Greek neighborhoods of my hometown. So, uh, <laughs> so maybe but, uh, kebab can make peace. Maybe we should do uh, integrate kebab into the uh, structures of, of peace. <laughs> yes. Well, I, I have to tell you that uh, years later, when we started the peace movement in Cyprus, um, a, a lot of progress was made when Greeks and Turks came together and shared food. Yeah. But we can talk about that later as well. Yeah, so um, it, those stories are really um, um, allow us to follow the, the conflict and how it evolved in, in Cyprus. Um, and uh, eventually um, there was the buffer zone uh, that was provided uh, by the UN as a safe area, but still, that did not prevent the violence um, or uh, solve the problem. Um, can you share with us the story that happened in the buffer zone and what did you learn from that? Okay, um, 
first of all, a, a little bit of background, uh, you know, to, to get to that story. Um, after independence, uh, inter-ethnic violence with two conflicting nationalisms, with two conflicting national agendas um, colliding, we had various episodes of violence. Uh, initially, the, uh, the Turkish Cypriot community in Cyprus was the, the weaker side, uh, strategically, as it were. And they lived in uh, Turkish areas that became enclaves, really. Uh, so you can imagine uh, the Turkish Cypriot is uh, the minority in Cyprus, about you know 18 to 20 percent. But they lived uh, when the clash started; they were uh, quite disadvantaged, and they lived in enclaves which were surrounded by um, their own their own fighters at the periphery, and outside of that there was another ring of UN peacekeepers. And outside of that, there was a ring of Greek fighters. Uh, and this was a combination of militia as well as uh, military. Um, and this lasted uh, for a number of years. Um, and then we had another culminating uh, tragic event, a dual tragic event, uh, which had to do with a coup d'etat that was launched by the Greek junta at the time. Uh, very right-wing nationalist uh, regime that came to power in the context of Cold War politics. And uh, they launched the coup d'etat in Cyprus to overthrow the president because he was stigmatized as being not quite right-wing uh, because he reached out to the left wing mm -hmm. within Cyprus. So um, this happened in 1974. Uh, summer of 1974, the conflict erupted, uh, and it was really a civil conflict of Greeks versus Greeks, essentially. Um, and it was terrible. Uh, and this came in the midst of unresolved ethnic conflict between Greeks and Turks. So the problem became multi-level. And the Cold War also became implicated because the big powers with the US leading the West and Russia leading the East, as it was called at the time, uh, had political connections with the different factions in Cyprus. So Cyprus became a flashpoint of these multiple levels of conflict uh, and crushed the island, essentially. So about five days after the coup d'etat, uh, the big fear among the Turkish community was that uh, they would turn against them. Uh, there were voices saying that this is a, a, a conflict uh, within the Greek community and the Turks shouldn't be worried. But if you were a Turk uh, living in an enclave and feeling that you are a minority, uh, there was no trust because the assumption was that if Greeks are killing each other, why, would they, why wouldn't they kill us? Uh, so this was really the, the climate and, and the stage at the time. So at that time, in the midst of a coup, uh, a civil war essentially uh, between Greeks and Turks, which also involved the regiments from Greece, uh, Turkey invaded Cyprus with a massive army. Uh, Turkey is the biggest military power in the region. And the invasion uh, really devastated uh, the island. It really uprooted uh, a fifth of the population that became refugees. Um, there was a ceasefire at the end of the day, at the end. And uh, there was also prisoner exchange because Turkey invaded from the north. They took over the northern part of Cyprus, uh, but all the Greeks who were trapped there became prisoners of war, and all the Turks that lived in the south became prisoners of war. And a lot of them were neighbors uh, to the other side. Uh, so it was really very messy. Then there was prisoner exchange, essentially. Uh, so the Turks that lived in the south moved to the north, and the Greeks that lived in the north, moved to the south. 
So the war, the coup d'etat, and then the Turkish invasion, uh, which ended up being an occupation to this day, um, segregated the, commun the ethnic communities. Uh, and it's important to note that uh, for about 400 years, Greeks and Turks in Cyprus lived in mixed villages and mixed, mixed cities. All the cities, all the major cities were mixed and hundreds of villages were ethnically mixed. Uh, but the, the polarization came with the rise of nationalism, which developed these very contradictory national agendas. So from the uh, war of 1974, uh, the island became segregated and the line that divides the Turkish North from the Turkish South is really the ceasefire line of 1974. Wow. But there were developments since that time. The developments were, was that uh, there was a treadmill of diplomacy that couldn't really resolve the problem. Uh, in 83, the Turkish uh, community in the North uh, resorted to a unilateral declaration of independence and they established the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus. Uh, it has not managed to get international recognition. The only country that recognizes it uh, is Turkey. Uh, but the claim of the Turkish Cypriots is that, you know, they suffered hugely uh, prior to the Turkish invasion. And now, as they say, we can sleep at night. But at the same time, a fifth of the Greek population lost their homes, they became refugees. Uh, the loss of life, of course, was unimaginable um, and unrestorable. Uh, and to this day, there are outstanding issues of uh, return uh, of property, restitution uh, of human rights issues, uh, of missing people uh, after all these years which it goes to show that violent conflict does not end uh, when the news reports do not cover it. That they continue most of the times for an entire generation, if not more. So um, I'm getting now to the buffer zone. The buffer zone story started when um, some of us uh, Cypriots you know, who studied abroad went back to Cyprus um, we really started to feel that the insecurity in which we lived was unsustainable and that at any moment something could erupt and we could have another clash and another war. And we watched, uh, we, we watched the politicians and in a sense we felt sorry for them because uh, under conflict conditions, uh, the only way politicians can rise to power is to pour hatred on the other side and to show um, the capacity to go to war again and to show heroics and to show their war credentials. Uh, but once they come to power and they have to negotiate for peace, they have to reverse all that. So it's like driving down a highway and then you want to reverse. It becomes very, very difficult. <laughs> so, uh, because you cannot stake your political career and your credentials uh, on a conflict habituated culture and conflict habituated values. And then turn around into peace. That reflection led us to recognize that there is no way to have peace unless we start building a peace constituency. Because only when you build a peace constituency would political leaders dare to take the risks for peace. There are risks for war, we know that, but there are also risks for peace when it comes to uh, politicians and their career. So that thought eventually led us to the realization that we need, we need to talk with the other side. At some point, you need to talk, no matter what happens. Uh, a point in case, look, look, at, look at us today in the United States. We had two decades of war in, Taliban, in, in Afghanistan, and now we are talking with the Taliban face to face, and it's extraordinary. And I hope that it, it, it yields results. But so it was with us, with us in Cyprus. And then we said, we need to talk with the other side. And then we realized something extraordinary. And that is the fact that there was no space 
in which Greeks and Turks could meet. The conflict has segregated us to such a degree that we had no common space. And we realized that one of the things that conflict did, it, it's as though it shrunk the world and it made it impossible for us to cohabit the same spaces. And the violence, and we understood some things about violence because in, in essence, once things become violent between groups, between nations, between ethnic identity groups, and the shooting begins and the killing commences, what are we really saying to one another? We are really communicating with bullets, telling each other that the world is too small for both of us to coexist. So one of us has to go. Uh, metaphorically speaking, a violent conflict makes the world smaller, whereas peace opens it up. So we were shocked at the fact that we wanted to speak with the other side and it was impossible because there was no common space. And then we came up with the idea of approaching the United Nations who were manning the, uh, they were guarding the, uh, the, what we call the dead zone, which is really the buffer zone between the two sides. And we asked them whether we could you know, reach out and find people from the enemy side who would be willing uh, to engage in a first dialogue. Uh, at first they thought this would be absolutely impossible because uh, uh, what the UN does uh, when they assume their peacekeeping role, they essentially keep the rival sides apart. Uh, but part of the argument is that we cannot, we cannot live segregated in such a small island indefinitely and at some point uh, you have to start building bridges. Um, uh, yes, this was one of the entry points uh, that you see on your screen, one of the entry points that we, uh, uh, we had to cross. Um, so uh, we convinced them to give us a space in one of the buildings uh, inside the buffer zone, which is off limits for both sides. Um, I remember we got invited, there was an international uh, mediator there. Uh, his name is, um, uh, uh, his, his name is, uh, was Ron, um, Canadian that worked in the United States and did a lot of mediation work, Ron Fisher. And I remember uh, the permission was given and I received a telephone call telling me that, uh, yes, it's gonna happen. And I remember it was, a, it was a, in January, it was a rainy day and we had to go through all the checkpoints. Uh, we had to cross the Greek checkpoint, then the UN checkpoint, and then into the buffer zone. And the Turks on the other side had to cross the uh, UN checkpoint on their side, the Turks, uh, the Turkish, uh, first of all, the Turkish checkpoint, then the UN checkpoint into the buffer zone. So we met in this building, uh, which used to be a luxury hotel before the troubles. It's called the Elitra Palace Hotel. They gave us a room and, and it was actually leaking, even though it was on the first floor and there were three more floors on top of it. That's how atrocious the conditions were. But it was the first time that we had a chance to dialogue. It was very, very difficult. And it was just a small group of people. We were about 10, 10 to 12 people sitting around this uh, round table. And what, what was really striking about that first meeting that really shocked us into the realization of how conflict shapes us is how completely different the perspectives were as to what the Cyprus conflict was about. Who started it, how it started, who was to blame, who was the victim, who was, uh, who, who was the culprit. We had completely contradictory perspectives and I remember how depressed we were at the first encounter because we thought, you know, wow, we said, you know, if the other side sees the problem in this way, we will never solve it. But interestingly, we persisted, we stayed the course. And in staying the course, we started to deconstruct how the conflict shaped us. And we started to realize that the different political perspectives that were so contradictory were shaped by people's experience. 
So the experience that people have, you know, shape them. And conflict usually when it's protracted, it shapes our perception of reality. And it, it, it not only separates us physically, but it also separates us in terms of perceptions of reality. So conflict also generates conflicting perceptions of reality that need to be addressed. But in time, we started to understand each other and we started to appreciate uh, the pain and the anguish that each side went through. And we realized that we may disagree with uh, each other's political positions, but we share the common tragedy. Yeah. And that, um, that tragedy became a catalyst uh, and a motivator to move forward. Uh, to make a long story short, out of that first meeting, eventually came a movement uh, of citizens uh, which came to be known as the Cyprus uh, peace building movement. Uh, it was really a, a civilian initiative uh, with lots of bumps along the way, but eventually we drew in people. Uh, most of us, I would say, were part of what we call the, the middle, the middle level of society, but we pulled in people from the grassroots, but also politicians. Um, and the movement actually grew uh, to a considerable size to the point where uh, a third narrative started to emerge, acknowledging that violent conflict is a deeply alienating phenomenon that separates us. And that in our efforts to bridge that chasm by interacting, by meeting, by facing very hard truths, about the past, we managed to create a third narrative that addresses uh, in an honorable way and in a fair way, the grievances of each side, the pain and the anguish of inside, each side, the hope of each side, and, a, a, and developing a common vision and a common strategy uh, of step-by-step and phase by phase pursuit of a sustainable system of peace. We are not quite there yet, uh, but at the same time, the killing is over, it has been over uh, for quite some time now, but the problem still persists. Uh, the last development that uh, has reintroduced uh, tension is the discovery of a natural gas uh, around the island of Cyprus. Uh, and that created a new uh, dimension of the conflict. Uh, but it's imperative to understand also that uh, resources, depending how you frame them, can become either a catalyst for conflict or a catalyst for peace. Uh, but that is for the future. <laughs> I think I should pause there. Um, this is really beautiful um, how, you know, this is a turning point for, for um, that conflict. Um, so to, I, one of your biggest um, uh, topics that you've researched and that you've re reflected on is nationalism. And uh, for, if you can share with us the story of the mother who lost her child to, to that um, to, to the polarization that is created by nationalism and what lesson did she teach you, the peace builders who led that process? Uh, and uh, because I think the lesson that she taught you is a lesson we all need to hear today. Uh, well, um, again, a little context. Uh, the problem of nationalism is really a huge, a huge phenomenon that came with the advent of modernity and the rise of nation state. And I just want to say a couple of things here to give a little bit of context. Um, some of the characteristics of nationalism that I think you know, we, we need to keep in mind is that it's a, it's a world and life view. You know, it, it entails a view of the state, a view of nationhood, a view of identity, a view of territory. But what is distinctive about it is that it has this exclusivist notion uh, that if you belong to a nation state, the nation state has to have a singular identity. This is ethnocentric nationalism. But if you look at real societies in the world, 
you will never find a purely ethnic society. Societies are a mix of things. Uh, they have males and females, they have people of different professions, they have different ethnicities, they have mixed ethnicities, they have different identities. But the ethnocentric nationalism that came from the 19th century insists that to have a nation state, the nation has to fa have a singular identity. And if you project that singular identity on the nation states, and you say the nation state is only French, or the nation state is only German, or whatever, or only Greek, or only Turkish, then social groups that don't fit into that identity will be marginalized. They will be viewed as not belonging, as having unequal status in that nation state with respect to standards of living, opportunities, etc. Um, the racial issue is really a byproduct of this monoethnic uh, notion of uh, nationalism. Uh, but another characteristic of nationalism, which is really extraordinary, is the capacity of that narrative to mobilize masses of people for war. We have seen this from the 19th century all the way to the end of the Second World War, with lots of efforts in Europe to move beyond nationalism, but nationalism has relapsed in the post 9-11 world. Uh, and one thing that can be said about nationalism uh, is that it's the, it's, it's the biggest mobilizer that um, can bring people together to fight other people. No other ideology uh, has had that capacity. And one of the things that it's extraordinary about it is that it is extremely moralistic. It has these moral overtones, that it's uh, the highest of moral duties uh, to kill for the nation and to die for the nation. Uh, you know, there was this idea during the Enlightenment that now that you know, science has emerged, you know, we have given up uh, the myths of the ancients, including you know, the sacrificing of human beings to mythical gods. But if you look at uh, nationalism, um, it really had the capacity in history uh, to rationalize and even expect uh, citizens to both offer their life in the name of the nation and to also take the life of others in the name of the nation. And this, these are the heroics that the nationalist narratives uh, have developed. Uh, the most spiritual critiques of nationalism argue that nationalism is a form of modern idolatry. Why? Because within the mindset of nationalism, the nation is set higher than human life. And that is why it can rationalize the sacrifice of human life, the giving of human life and the taking of human life. This was something that the Europeans had to face at the end of the World War because they fought for freedom, for democracy, for justice, for all sorts of things. But by 1945, uh, the huge realization started to descend on European societies that neither freedom was gained, nor justice was restored, nor um, democracy thrived, and neither did any nation have self-determination because the war swallowed everything. Europe was flattened. Yes, you celebrate victory, but the victory uh, that is celebrated uh, is the victory of flags. It's not the victory of people. And this is what led Europe to that huge transformation that eventually led to the European Union, uh, which was probably the most significant historical attempt to put nationalism behind them. But now we have a relapse of nationalism with rising tensions and rising polarizations. And we have it also uh, between uh, countries, but also within countries. So uh, that's just a little bit on uh, the issue of uh, nationalism. 
nationalism has a, a huge difficulties accepting that society is a diverse. It has huge difficulties embracing the realities uh, that uh, societies uh, have mixed belief systems and that societies have multiple uh, group identities. Uh, because it has this singular approach to nationhood, to territory, to statehood, and to identity. So there is something contradictory about nationalism and democracy. And the challenge is to raise democracy above nationalism. Harry, but I want you to tell us the story about the mom, because that story symbolizes... Yes, this was a story where... Uh, yeah. There was a casualty. There was a really a, a very disturbing event where uh, there was a lot of um, agitation about the fact that the Cyprus problem was not being resolved. Uh, a lot of the refugees uh, living in the south wanted to return to their homes in the north. Uh, the Turkish refugees in the north didn't want to return to their homes in the south because their experience was different. Um, and to make a long story short, there was an effort by uh, some uh, young uh, motorcyclists who declared openly that they were going to drive their motorcycles, you know, into the buffer zone and cross to the other side, no matter what. And I remember at the time we were very concerned because uh, that, that was a recipe for disaster. And I remember we discussed it uh, between, you know, the Greeks and the Turks that we used to meet in the buffer zone. And we anticipated that people would be killed. Um, and of course, the, the important thing is that, uh, you know, when the two sides agree to a UN peacekeepers, uh, any entry without permission into the buffer zone uh, is considered by the United Nations as a violation of the ceasefire, which shows you how, uh, how dangerous that would be. But, uh, you know, the, the cyclists organized and, you know, it was really a very, very tense situation. And uh, because of the nationalism, everybody supported them. You know, they were donating money to the banks to support the effort. The Turkish side was, you know, mobilizing their troops along the ceasefire line, uh, declaring that anybody that crosses is going to get shot. So the situation became very tense. And it was going to happen on a Sunday. And the day before, the Secretary General of the United Nations called the Greek president and asked him to cancel the event. And he actually did, uh, to his credit. But the momentum that had been built up, uh, had been building up all along, was so powerful uh, that even though the government uh, on the Greek side uh, had the police block the main highways to the points along the a ceasefire line where the protesters were going to uh, congregate. Uh, the protesters who were all cyclists, they diverted to somewhere else uh, and clashes uh, occurred in the buffer zone. And the unfortunate thing was that two Greeks got shot who entered the buffer zone. One of them, you know, climbed uh, the, uh, the flagpole to bring down the Turkish flag and he was shot while he was doing that. But the other one, very tragically, and it was televised uh, live, uh, he was beaten to death when he was uh, trapped on the barbed wire uh, in the buffer zone. And then the next cycle of events was you know, the Turkish side warning that you know, uh, more people will get killed if they try to cross to the other side. The Greek side was outraged by the killings and uh, there was a lot of uh, emotion um, in the public domain. And uh, the burials, you know, were being prepared and uh, people came from all over to uh, support the family that lost uh, a young man, two of them actually. And uh, there were a lot of speeches about heroics, uh, about how proud the family should be. And at one unsuspecting moment, they heard, uh, the mother was heard uh, saying that I would rather my son would not be a hero, but be alive. And I think that utterance um, really shattered the ideological constructs that have been created around the conflict. Why? Because 
she pointed to the most vital human dimension of the conflict. Because when human life is lost, we lose the most valuable of things that we have on earth. There is nothing more valuable than human life. So to make human life expendable is to degrade the greatest value, which is human life. And this is why we have to become more reflective about conflicts, about violent conflict, about war and the like. And in that story, um, it's fascinating how the same person was perceived based on nationalism. He was a villain on one side and he was a hero on the other. But the ultimate truth was that his life mattered to his mom more than anything. It's very, uh, it's tragic. And, um, and, and that moves us to um, when you came to the US and uh, you arrived around September 11, when it happened and those notions of nationalism. And also today in our modern, you know, the recent events, um, ideological conflict causing violence on the streets in the US. Um, so what's your, let's talk about that. Let's talk about the recent events. Um, it seems that people are not talking to each other. Um, I was, for example, it seems that the people are, they want democracy, but how they behave seems undemocratic, especially the leaders. For example, um, uh, Pelosi was uh, the Speaker of the House. She didn't want Biden to debate with Trump. Uh, so there's no space for, for the conflicting ideologies to, to talk. On the other hand, Trump um, uh, dismisses the protesters from the NBA who uh, are objecting um, and protesting peacefully to the current, to the recent events and the violence. So there you have those political leaders. I'm, I don't know like what is it that they're trying to achieve here, uh, it, but it doesn't seem um, helpful for looking at historic events where um, this is emphasizing just the polarization and the ideological conflict. So what is going on here, Harry? It's really confusing. And, and we see people dying on the street. Well, I, I would simply say that are confused to have a more truthful perspective as to what's going on, because what is going on can be extremely confusing. Uh, it doesn't mean that uh, there isn't a reality that can be analyzed and deconstructed, but the, uh, what you brought forward is really the tip of, of the iceberg of a polarization that has been taking place in the United States uh, for many, many years. But what we are seeing now are the consequences of unaddressed issues and, uh, and the consequence of you know, certain historical drivers that uh, warrant a great deal of analysis. Uh, I think we need to recall that we live in a, in a, in a post 9-11 world. Uh, the post 9-11 world uh, has really pushed societies uh, into a direction that made uh, groups increasingly radicalized. Um, we usually talk about you know, radicalization uh, of uh, you know, Islamic militants, uh, which is a real concern. Uh, we see programs in the West of, uh, uh, that have been set up both in Europe and the United States of uh, trying to de-radicalize people that become drawn uh, by you know, ideologies that are very radical and very militant. But I think the phenomenon of radicalization is much broader because uh, we have seen the people who have uh, in the past um, had an ideological position that uh, was a matter of preference to now having an ideological position that is fiercely projected uh, into society. Uh, and this is a shift. Um, obviously, you know, to understand what is happening today, I think one needs to go back to 9-11, the response to 9-11. Uh, I remember uh, I, 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 I relocated to the United States, it was about a year uh, after 9-11. And I remember I was on the plane flying over and uh, I was, 
uh, I felt, uh, I remember my thoughts. I actually said, you know, wow, you know, at last I'm going to get away from the Eastern Mediterranean and away from all this ethnocentric nationalism and the militancy uh, and the, um, and the conflict that it created. And I remember coming to the US uh, a year after 9-11 and experiencing a tsunami of a new nationalism. It was like a tidal wave that really swept across the land. Look at and, this, it's madness. I mean, this photo well, is madness. Uh, well, I, I, I would refrain using that term because uh, you cannot disconnect the nationalism from the pain and the insecurity and the anguish that, that the society and the people within it uh, felt after 9-11. Uh, the problem is that that anguish and the pain and the insecurity uh, was absorbed into a nationalism uh, that uh, was really part and parcel of the narrative that supported warfare. Uh, I remember how um, difficult it was to see uh, the degree of support for responding to 9-11 through warfare. Uh, it was interpreted at the time as an act of war. It would have been much more prudent to identify 9-11 as a crime against humanity and to use intelligence and policing worldwide uh, to bring those people to justice and by so doing uh, we would have not lost the political capital that was gained because there was a lot of empathy uh, directed to the United States after 9-11. I recall reading um, uh, the writings of a person who was part of the Nuremberg trials. Uh, he was one of the judges in the Nuremberg tri uh, uh, trials, still alive. Uh, and he was overwhelmed by what was happening because he said that people don't know what war is. Uh, war, nationalism glorifies war. Nationalism makes warfare into a, a, a festival. Uh, but sooner than later, the consequences of war you know, caught up. Uh, it was depleting resources, lives were being lost. Uh, there's also some paradoxes as well because uh, uh, the interaction between wars, warfare and uh, insurgencies did not really re reduce uh, terrorism, it amplified it because the fog of war, as it is called, is the, is the best cover uh, to mobilize insurgents and to mobilize terrorism. And global statistics show that there has been an increase, not a decrease. So it becomes very ambiguous and it also becomes paradoxical because the, the wars were launched to make sure that 9-11 doesn't happen again, which was a very dark and sinister event. There's no doubt about that. But at the same time, the wars took the life of twice the number of people, the twice the number of Americans that lost their life on 9-11, uh, which raises fundamental questions, not to speak of the thousands of lives which were lost on the opposite side and the dislocation that occurs in the societies where warfare took place and the displacement of refugees and the loss of innocent lives. Uh, some of those consequences are irreparable. Uh, some people take pride in the fact that they say, okay, you know, uh, there was a war, but at least uh, the world got rid of Saddam Hussein and the world is better off with Saddam, without Saddam Hussein. Yes, but you can't say that without at the same time asking the question, is the world better off with uh, over seven and a half thousand Americans uh, dead and over uh, nearly a quarter of a million uh, people dead in these wars? Because that's the cost. So uh, there is something really ambiguous uh, about warfare that needs to be understood. And I think one of the errors that is still with us uh, in the West generally is that warfare is a means to certain ends. That is an erroneous position because warfare is not just a means. Warfare is a regime. You know, the, uh, the assumption is that uh, you have a bad regime and you go to war and you change it and you make a good regime. But warfare becomes a regime in protracted warfare. 
uh, and it has consequences. It reduces the value of human life. It makes democracy practically impossible. It creates the conditions for corruption. Uh, it sustains you know, fear and anguish and uncertainty. And there are regressions uh, on every level. Uh, it creates a regime uh, where human rights are violated. That, that's, that's the essence of warfare. So it's not just the means, it's a regime. So uh, the challenge is to understand that it's a regime and to deploy different means uh, in addressing uh, differences. Uh, and that becomes paramount when it comes to especially big powers. Very interesting. So you're, you're saying in a way, um, war just changes the mindset of, of leaders and how they operate, the decisions that being made uh, the seems that the ends justify the means. Um, so if we if we move forward to, to to our modern tensions here, like war at a scale, like national conflict, um, we have internal conflict now in the U.S. and it's yes. uh, it's really hard to make sense um, out of like or to have clarity because to me I'm confused personally because. Yeah. People are, they want um, something better. Um, and then they are, and there's the violence. And recently we've had the events of, in uh, Wisconsin. Uh, it felt, I was watching this and I was thinking, this is like the Wild West. The, the wild West. It's, uh, and we're in the 20, 2020. Yes. So what is the role of the leaders that we hope to see that could uh, minimize those tensions. Uh, what is the role that we all hold responsible? Are we not talking enough? Because I'm remi remembering what you've said, there was no space in violence. Um, conflict makes the world small and peace makes the world big. And it seemed that we don't have space to talk or dialogue in the US. If you're conflicting with me on my opinion or my idea, we're just too polarized. People just don't even talk. What, what should we do, Harry? Okay. Uh, I think that question starts at the end. I'm going to move to the beginning because okay. I, I, think, I think our discussion warrants some reference to the historical drivers that brought us here, okay, um, which, which are complex. Uh, because on the one hand, when we look at the situation today, especially in regard to the black community, uh, that is a historical residue that goes way back. In fact, one can say it goes way back hundreds of years. So we need to put things in context. But generally, when we look at our society today, uh, I think one can identify three major drivers that, has, that have transformed uh, the way our society today operates. Um, and I think it's probably helpful in, in summary form to identify three historical drivers that can be identified as threats that people experience, okay? Since 9-11, one of the major threats that have been part of our experience has been the security threat, uh, the terrorism. You know, at any time, anything can happen. It's very unpredictable. Uh, it's it, it's it's a it's a it's an unclear and present danger. That's how it's experienced, but it creates a heightened sense uh, to uh, it's a heightened need for protection. Uh, this inclination uh, tends to make societies more tolerant for military solutions. It makes it more tolerant when it comes to um, how we protect ourselves, by what means we protect ourselves. And the higher the fear, the more severe the means by which we protect ourselves. Uh, over the years, we have seen a rise of malicious, uh, and the opinion around militias is very divided. Uh, there is one, uh, one side of the divide 
Nazis militia as uh, dangerous people. Some of them have been classified by the FBI as terrorists or potential terrorists. Uh, there's another portion of the American leadership and the American citizenry that see them as patriots uh, guarding the homeland. Uh, this is a, a huge divergence uh, in perspectives. But the, but the security threat uh, has also um, moved society into more uh, radicalizing directions. Today we see militias uh, re-emerging in the mainstream. They used to be marginal. They used to be, um, yeah, uh, they, they, they used to be at the fringes, but now they have entered the mainstream and we see our militia being formed as we speak. But what is different today is that uh, whereas originally um, the recourse to uh, arms and to militia was a reaction to 9-11, now uh, the sense of insecurity has to do with what goes on inside the United States. And this creates uh, huge, huge uh, difficulties, especially because it reinforces the gun culture. Uh, today, if you are on one side where you feel that the police, for example, uh, has been your enemy, has not really offered you protection, uh, and uh, where you have a track record of the police shooting your own people, well, how do you find protection? Well, you go and buy a gun or you get a gun. And then you have the other side that says, well, there is just too much violence in the streets and there is destruction of property and they want to defund the police and the police is so overburdened, they, can't, they cannot do their job and they are not really capable on their own to protect us. So what do we have to do? Well, we go and buy guns. Um, it's very important to note uh, and then you have the, the shop owners who say that this is uh, becoming uh, unruly. Uh, my livelihood has been destroyed. I need to protect what I have. What do I do? If I don't feel secure, I go and buy a gun. So everybody's armed. Not everybody's trigger happy, but everybody is trigger ready. And that poses a huge danger for the country. And I just wanted to bring that out. Um, so this is the security threat, one may say. Then the second driver that brought us here is what I call the economic threat. And the economic threat was really heightened by the, uh, uh, the meltdown of the financial system in 2008, because that meltdown uh, really exposed the vulnerabilities of the economy in ways that was quite unprecedented. So people become far more defensive when it comes to their interests, to their financial interests. And they become you know, far more concerned that um, e economic progress takes place in a way that benefits them. Um, and uh, what is extraordinary here is to acknowledge uh, that not everyone in the United States is in the same economic position. There are huge disparities. And the pandemic actually brought these disparities out along with a lot of other things that the pandemic exposed. So the, the economic threat is becoming uh, really part of the, the dynamic of conflict. And in fact, uh, a lot of what we see, uh, especially in, in the demonstrations, uh, one vital dimension of the demonstrations uh, and the, the racial divide is also the economic divide. The economic divide feeds into these things. The, 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 it, it feeds into um, the, the pain and the anguish of not being able to make ends meet. Uh, and this is uh, unacceptable in a society as wealthy as America. But then you have the other side uh, who, whose experience has been positive in the US as far as the economy is concerned. They have prospered, 
they have raised the standard of living, they have educated their children, uh, they feel economically secure. But when they see the unrest in the streets, they feel that their economic well-being is being threatened. So they come out with guns too. So the economic threat uh, has really complicated things. And then we also have what I call the identity threat, that people feel that their identity. But again, America is one of the most diverse societies in the world when it comes to identity groups. Uh, and there is a pretense by various groups that America should have only one identity. It's practically impossible to define America in terms of one ethnic identity, one religious identity, one secular identity, you name it. It's very difficult. Uh, when I travel back to Cyprus, people ask me, well, uh, how is America? Uh, and my immediate response, it's almost uh, visceral, I say, which America? <laughs> because there are plenty of Americans. Yeah, Americas. And, the, and the identity threat uh, becomes entangled with the security threat and the economic threat. And uh, I would also say that uh, the racial issue is also a byproduct of the identity threat. Because when you look at the minority communities, especially the black communities, um, in light of the nationalism that uh, was really part and parcel of building America, you know, with you know, manifest destiny and uh, ideological constructs like that, uh, you get a clear sense that the singular identity that the nationalism of the 19th century and 20th century uh, asserted uh, to be the real, the so-called real identity of America uh, excluded the black. They were not considered to be a real Americans. And the issue of identity uh, was also accentuated after 9-11 when for the first time, uh, it was during the first years when uh, I relocated here, I heard the term a real American and non-real American. Uh, and that was, that was a first fracturing of American society in terms of identities and identity threats. And essentially what the narrative said was that, you know, uh, there are two kinds of Americans, real Americans and fake Americans. And the real Americans are those that descended from uh, white Northern Europeans that are, and are Christian. And then uh, everybody else, you know, whether you're Asian, whether you're black, whether you're Native American, who, uh, who was here long before the Europeans arrived, you're not a real American. Uh, this was, of course, is part of, of how warfare incubates suspicion. And the wars uh, really uh, incubated suspicion of all by all. Uh, so um, it's not really uh, a surprise, but it's really tragic that these differentiated stigmas uh, around identity became part of the entire uh, turmoil that now surrounds us. Uh, and now all these things are coming to a head. And they're coming to a head in part because of the pandemic. Uh, there is something about the pandemic that is unprecedented. Uh, first of all, it's a global pandemic. Uh, and it shut down the entire globe. Never before in human history have we encountered this. But at the same time, it brought to the surface a lot of the insufficiencies of the societies uh, in which we live. Uh, it brought to the surface uh, a lot of the conflicts. It's as though the pandemic pulled the curtain back and made visible things that were partly visible before. So what we see today really is uh, obviously the conflict between the pro-police and the anti-police movement. Uh, we see clashes between ideological groups uh, in the streets. Uh, now, as of recent developments uh, in Kenosha, for example, in Wisconsin, we have armed groups in the streets, uh, pro and against the police, pro and against the authorities. Um, 
we have uh, also uh, the wealth disparities became very, very prominent because people cannot make ends meet under the conditions of the lockdown. Uh, we have a conflict between those who prioritize the economy and those who prioritize health. Uh, that is also another issue. Um, we also have um, a rise in uh, not only hate crimes, but hate attitudes it has mm -hmm. become very, very widespread. And fringe groups have now come into the forefront of historical developments. Uh, and that is dangerous, especially with the rising number of, of uh, sales in firearms. They have skyrocketed. Uh, the BBC did a survey and they were surprised by how many people went out and bought guns. So it's almost like a perfect storm for more, more unrest. Um, we, even, we even had, I mean, the culture wars in, this, in the US, which are not new, have become much more uh, toxic, uh, much more polarizing. Um, but more so, the, the party system in the United States has become extremely toxic uh, at the very top. So one of the big challenges uh, has to do with leadership. Uh, so we have the pandemic, we have the exposure of all these conflicts. And in the middle of the pandemic, we also have presidential elections. So we really have this, this cascade of tensions and conflicts coming together in a storm. And we also have a hurricane, two hurricanes in fact, to deal with. Uh, so that's really a lot. I think it's really imperative to understand that. And at the same time, both sides in this conflict claim democracy and freedom. But if the relationship between the different groups in conflict in the United States, from the grassroots and the fringe groups all the way to the established political parties, if the relationships between them become so eroded that they become dysfunctional, then democracy becomes dysfunctional. The greatest threat to democracy is the dysfunctionality of relationships between groups in the United States at this moment. Wow. And it's a much bigger threat to democracy than, than any threat from the outside these days. Uh, there is a lot talk, a lot talk about freedom and democracy, and uh, you know the land of the free and the brave. Uh, th these are nice, uh, you know, little captions. But the reality today is that uh, we live in a very polarized society, dangerously so. We live in a society with a lot of fear, with a lot of anger. Uh, there is violence everywhere. We have to acknowledge that. And part of the problem that we see today is that each side is very selective in terms of what they condemn and what they, and what they project into the public domain. Uh, it's true that there is a legacy of uh, excessive force by the police when it comes to the black community. You know, there is just no way around that. Uh, but at the same time, we can say that every, every single policeman uh, functions and wants to function in that way. Um, on the other side, yes, there have been uh, violence in the streets and clashes uh, and looting, uh, but you can't say that everybody who demonstrates there is a hooligan. But this is what the two sides are saying to each other. So they downplay issues that have to do with their own side and they upplay uh, the vulnerabilities of the other side. Uh, politics have become extremely toxic. I, I, I have come to the point where I'm beginning to think that the actions of each side in this toxic environment, they do more to mobilize the base of the other side rather than one zone. Um, at the same time, violence needs to be condemned on all sides, but at the same time, you cannot ignore the grievances, some of which are structural, some of which are cultural, some of which are historical, and they are deeply rooted in history. 
especially when we consider minorities that have a history of deprivation, that live in fear of the police, that live in fear of the authority, that live in fear of being evicted, that live in fear of not having enough resources to make a decent living, uh, that live in fear of not being able to give their children the safety and the security and the education and the resources that they need. Uh, one of the things that really surprises me about uh, the country in which we live is that at the end of the Second World War, the US launched the Marshall Plan that really uh, resurrected Europe out of the ashes of war and the destructiveness of war, which incidentally was the most destructive war in human history. Uh, the most tragic event. That's why there is nothing heroic about it, really. Uh, when you compare, for instance, the crematoria and the nuclear bomb, is there that much difference, really, you see. Uh, but at the same time, when the war ended, the United States launched the Marshall Plan, and they put the whole of Europe, at least Western Europe at the time, on its feet. And what puzzles me is why couldn't the leadership of the United States launch mar multiple Marshall plans for all these historical issues that still plague American society? But perhaps... A very legitimate question, uh, Harry, and a very insightful one. I hate to cut to you, but um, I know that people, this is time for Q&A and we're ah, already okay. Here. Yeah, so one of your students, Alec, he's been waiting for this episode patiently. Oh, I see. He was like, <laughs> is talking together for peace to, uh, to be, to watch you and, and hear you. And I know he has uh, a comment and a question. So I'm gonna share both uh, with you to, to answer. Um, if nationalism, he says, if nationalism and other, Alec uh, Chaba, uh, if nationalism and other ideologies can be conceived um, of as traps, between quotations, for the mind, then is part of the escape from such a trap to become aware of these traps, for example, being disillusioned the same way the words of the Greek mother dead. So, so that's a comment. And then his question, how might a peace uh, constituency be formed when it is unclear who the parties to a conflict are because they're, they're con con conjoin conjoining identifiers are unclear? So those are very smart and ins insightful uh, questions by Alec. Any, any um, answers? And we have about eight minutes before we wrap this up. Well, uh, I have to congratulate Alex because he wrapped about 10 questions into, into <laughs> one. <laughs> really, I, again, I would like to stress that the, the challenges we face today are, are multi-level and they are complex. So there is no one answer, but, but there are starting points. It would be wonderful, for example, if people in leadership positions from the very top of the political hierarchy to the neighborhood, they see the wisdom of addressing problems jointly with the other side, however big or however small. The biggest challenge today is to work across conflict lines. It's not easy. Uh, it's not gonna produce automatic solutions but it will start a process, a process that can lead to action. But we need the, the courage and the bravery to diagnose the problems. And there are problems, very serious problems. There are problems with respect to culture and beliefs. There are problems which has to do with how society is organized. There are problems uh, that have to do with uh, access to wealth and resources. There are problems that have to do with uh, the challenge uh, to embrace identities which are beyond our immediate identity because we live in the same societies. Uh, so to have some engagement along those lines is imperative. What, what needs to be understood 
is that the problems we face are of such a nature that no one side can resolve them on its own. And I think we need to be realistic about elections as well. I want to make a point about that. If the relationships uh, uh, continue to become polarized and toxic, uh, as we are observing them unfolding before our eyes today, and we have the presidential elections, and we have either the same administration or a change administration, nothing will change because the divisions will persist. We will still have to address how to improve the relationships, how to make the relationships functional enough to be able to jointly address problems, complex problems. And these problems cannot be addressed in the streets. Protests are very important, especially nonviolent protests, because they draw attention to the problems. But you cannot solve these problems in the streets because they are complex. They take analysis, they take diagnosis, they take you know, strategic planning. Uh, and the only way to do that is to bring people around the table. Which so, uh, leads me to a question from the audience, which is a good one. He says, thank you for your knowledge, stories and insight. My question is how do you create dialogue and conversation between two groups who have different ideas of good and evil? Well, I can, I can answer by the opposite first of all. If they don't dialogue, they will destroy each other. They will harm each other. They will do injustice to their children. They will give their children an inheritance that will be terrible, which is the division and the toxicity and the mistrust. My answer is that you do that by starting. Just start wherever. I can tell you a little story that uh, was quite revealing to me. Uh, one of my students uh, did his internship uh, in Rotary, downtown Portland. Uh, and then he had to write an analysis of what he saw and he focused particularly on the uh, Peace Builders Committee. And uh, he said a lot of very interesting things. You know, he uh, interviewed tons of people, but one of the things he wrote in his report was that um, he was stunned, he said, by the fact that the people in Rotary have different political persuasions. And yet, because their relationships are amicable, they come together and they work together on projects that are very useful to society. Now, I wanna make one point here uh, that I think is very significant, and that is uh, the, uh, the, the, the enrichment that we get when we have multiple perspectives and different perspectives. Um, you know, in studies and research, uh, we have you know, lots of uh, anecdotal evidence that when people come together to resolve conflict and you have multiple perspectives, you get optimal outcomes. But what they don't tell you is that that only happens if the relationships are functional. If the relationships are dysfunctional, diverse perspectives become catalysts for polarization and conflict and sometimes dangerously so. Harry? So, so the number one challenge today is to mend the relationships, is to improve the relationships. So the big challenge that America has for leadership is to see people across the conflict lines whether it's in neighborhoods, in cities, in ideological camps, in religions, in political parties, to have the courage to come together and struggle. There is no way out except by struggling with, with significant aspects of the truth. And the truth is not one thing, it's many things. Um, so Henry, because, yes. we are, because we are part of, um, we are responsible. If you are in a polarized environment, we all take part of that responsibility in one way or another. What is it, the advice that you would give for each one of us individually that can um, make every day, the decisions that we can make every day? Is there a principle that you can um, help us with 
uh, to guide our attitude or approach to uh, someone when we talk about difficult or different ideologies. I, I, like, I like the quote from the book um, about values um, and how can we sometimes um, use values for different purposes. So it just remind us of how, yes. what values are and how we project them into the okay. world. Well, I, I was actually ready to say before you started your comments that a good directive to have, if you wish and if you have the courage and if you want to build the courage uh, to start building bridges across conflict lines, is not necessarily to give up your belief systems, your ideologies or your values. Uh, it, but it's very important to tamper them. It's very important to deflate them. It's very important to put them in the background. Why? Because if we absolutize our values, we become fundamentalists. And then our values become a criterion for condemning others who are not like us, who don't share the same ideological uh, framework. Um, you mentioned the Pope, and I remember we discussed this, uh, who made one very interesting point, and I would like to share it. He's a very uh, unusual Pope, but I think there is a lot of wisdom that comes from him. Uh, and I'm not Catholic, you should know that. <laughs> but it doesn't matter, because doesn't uh, matter. truth cannot be contained. I'm definitely and, not Catholic. And reality <laughs> cannot be contained in, in, in institutionalized religion. But he he talked about values and he posed a warning and he put it this way he says we have to be aware in case we turn our values into stones by which we stone those we disagree with and at that point our values become weapons they cease to be directives they become weapons and weapons can kill they can kill psychologically, they can kill socially, they can kill politically. So they, there is also something else as well that uh, we need to say here when it comes to values. Um, <laughs> there is really two different approaches to values, one uh, and two categories of values. There is uh, what one may call our professed values, the values we articulate, where we say, this is what I believe, and I support my beliefs. But there is also our lived values. The way we live reflects values that are far more important than the values we articulate. So if I am in a relationship that is really toxic and my behavior enhances the toxicity, it doesn't matter if I espouse democracy or any other you know, regime or any other value, because the action and the behavior uh, always transcends the articulated belief. So it's not about what values we hope to, it's what actions we resort to, it's what behavior we project that is far more important. In fact, that's where the issue of what we value becomes manifest. It's not what I say I value, it's what I value in how I live, in how I act, in how I behave. And here again, you know, we are confronted with huge injustices, huge insecurities, uh, huge, you know, divergences in perception. Um, we have huge uh, wealth and resource disparities, but the only way we can address them is by restoring the relationships enough to be able to address and struggle with resolving these problems. And it's not gonna be one year, it's gonna be five years and 10 years. We have to have the courage to stay the course in the interest of peace and human rights. This is imperative. Um, and in this regard, okay. So because yes. it's at 3.30, 3 I would like uh, to kind of wrap this up, but for those who would like to stay, 
um, Harry and I would continue to talk for another half an hour about um, other, um, um, other thoughts uh, to elaborate on uh, values and how we can handle the pandemic. Uh, it's very deep conversation, so, uh, but we've covered most of the points that we wanted in, um, for the first hour and a half. But because Harry is just a wealth of uh, knowledge and wisdom, um, I'm keeping I'm keeping you, Harry, on the uh -oh. another half hour uh, for those who wish to stay. But I want to officially um, uh, wrap up our official time uh, to respect uh, the attendees um, um, to attendees time. And um, so we would like to call uh, to have a call to action to invite each one of you to um, at times of polarization to take a stand and talk to people that differ from us inquire with curiosity, not advocacy. It's time to listen um, to one another and internalize before we project our thoughts on others. Um, join the Rotary Action Group for Peace and um, a, a global network of peace builders. Share this episode of Together for Peace with friends and family and colleagues uh, to spread um, values of unity and dialogue. Uh, support Harry on his mission to expand the mission of peace by taking action with the Rotary Action Group for Peace and starting your own peace project because Harry is the co-founder of the RAC for Peace and supporting the RAC is supporting Harry's um, uh, vision for our world in, in peace. So Harry, what is your dream for our world in two short sentences so we can go back to the value discussion? Well, <laughs> uh, dreams are free of charge. So we can dream freely. In some ways, dreams are the first assertion of freedom. Um, there are so many dimensions uh, pertinent to our world in terms of which uh, we can dream. Uh, but there is an immediate dream and there is a long-term uh, dream. I think the immediate dream is to develop the courage and the sophistication to at least restore the relationship to a minimum level where we are enabled and empowered uh, to deal with the complexity of issues uh, that we face today. Uh, this, is, this is one issue. Um, the long-term vision has to do with the hope that we will value you know, human life and human well-being and social justice and democracy far beyond any partisan interest, whether it entails uh, a political party, a political ideology, a nation, because the world is becoming smaller. One of the things that the pandemic has exposed us to is that the world has become extremely interconnected. Uh, there was a lot of talk about supply chains being broken. Uh, the virus itself is global. Increasingly, the problems we are facing are global. So the challenge is to move outside of our respective narcissistic nationalism to address problems. The economies have become interconnected. The internet has that connected the whole world. All the stock markets are connected. <laughs> climate issues are not national. No individual nation can address them. Health issues can no longer be addressed by individual nations. So we are really moving in a direction where history uh, reveals to us uh, that uh, we, increasingly we will be living in a global village. Uh, we used to say that you know, no human is an island. Now we can say that no nation is an island. No religion is an island. No ethnic group is an island. Uh, and the world is becoming deterritorial. The idea is that you can build walls around the territory uh, is really uh, 200 years out of date. Uh, the world is not structured that way and the challenges have more to do with the need for collaboration, increasing collaboration to create that minimum consensus that empowers us to address problems. And here, is where the issue of peace also comes into play because peace increases freedom. P 
peace increases the capacity to be democratic. Peace increases the capacity to address social justice and economic equity. And I would leave it at that. Thank you, Harry. So I'm uh, going to share our outro and then I have a few couple questions for you, Harry, okay. about values and relationships. Uh, so uh, we can trust Harry to help us unravel and discover the complexities of truth. His sensitivity to bring out each other's humanity is how he teaches his students and colleagues how to think beyond ourselves and to take care of one another. Now that our conversation is nearing a close, you can see why Harry is one of my favorite people to chat with over tea. His thoughtful insight into the world's complex problems gives me hope that our world is always changing for the better and peace will prevail. Uh, thank you for joining us for another fascinating conversation on Together for Peace. Uh, and please join us next week with um, an interview with Dr. Sela Alworthy a three-time Nobel Peace Prize nominee and author of The Business Plan for Peace, Building a World Without War. Until next time, stay safe, stay healthy, keep your smile big and your heart open. Have a wonderful weekend, everyone, and wage peace. So for um, the people who decided to stay on the call uh, and those who are watching us on Facebook, uh, Stell, Harry, you mentioned something about relationships and you said, we need to nurture our relationships. And so the essence of relationships is love and trust. How do you view trust and love? How, how we can cultivate love and trust in our relationships at all levels, you know, with, with your work, you know, nationalism stems in a way from a sense of love for, for, for belonging, love for country, love for patriotism. Uh, but it's, you know, and also the anger that stems from it, you know, when you're angry, it's um, in times of, of peace, you love your country, but in times of war that transfer, transforms into um, uh, anger and frustration and uh, violence. So love and hate um, and fear all come from the same place. And, and so how can we cultivate love over fear and hate um, and peace over, um, conflict in our relationships how do you frame love as well <laughs> you have posed uh, probably the most challenging question <laughs> in this episode of your program i mean the, the issue of love is really uh, probably the ultimate challenge of human existence uh, but it's also the most elusive um, we all long for it but we never quite catch it. Uh, we want it as much as we fear it, but we all experience it. It's probably the most difficult thing to pin down and to define because it always escapes us. It's always ahead of us, it's never behind us. Uh, but it does, we know it through its manifestations. And one thing you can say about, uh, you know, acts of loving, acts of kindness, acts of care, uh, is that it edifies and it uplifts human life, and it, uh, it enhances human life. Um, love is the opposite of war, to put it simply, because in war, love goes out the window. In fact, under conditions of, of conflict and violence, uh, love becomes transformed into its opposite. Why do I say that? I say that because in times of violent conflict, uh, the tendency of people is to recoil in their most immediate identity group because you need communal support to take the pain of war. So we gather together and we develop extraordinary love for our ethnic or religious group or our, our own nation. But if conflict persists, uh, that love because, becomes a motivator for hate, you know? So love becomes the nature. I remember in the discussion, uh, this was, you know, way back in Cyprus, it was this, I was on a panel um, sharing what we discovered uh, by our determination to sustain and to build relationships with the other side 
because when you build relationships with the other side that become positive, you learn new things, your perspective changes, it expands, you understand more of reality, not less. Uh, there's something about conflict that diminishes knowledge. It doesn't amplify it, it doesn't expand it because you become preoccupied with your own survival and the survival of your group. But I remember in this exchange, uh, this fellow, he was a very, very staunch nationalist and uh, uh, he challenged me. He says that you, you are prodding us to reach out to the other side, to find ways to make peace with the other side. And uh, he said to me, you are a compromiser. You are compromising our position, you know, and you're weak. And my response to him was, uh, but if we continue the conflict, we will be compromising to the conflict. We will, give, we will be giving into the conflict. We will be surrendering to the conflict. And there is nothing heroic about that. And then he got upset and he said to me, are you telling me that I don't love my country? He says, I love my country. I would give my life for my country. And then I said, well, if you love your country, shouldn't you love all the inhabitants of your country? Because if you truly love your country, your love should be big enough to embrace everybody who is part of your country. And this is the big challenge for America today because everybody says that they love their country. But is, does that love fall short when it ends at the conflict line? Or does that love have enough power to extend to the other side? You see, it doesn't mean that you will agree. It doesn't mean that you neglect real issues and real injustices. But there is a historical imperative to expand the realm of care, the realm of kindness, the realm of, of love. And not only in actions, but issues of love and care have to also be institutionalized. It, it, it has implications about policy. It has implications about how society is organized. It has implications about how the economy is organized. It has implications about how children are raised uh, and how families conduct their lives and how uh, security is provided. There's a lot of talk about uh, national security, but there is also human security. And when humans within society become insecure, it becomes a national security issue. So, you know, the issue of love is extremely important, but we must not reduce it to just a f feeling good. We have to expand it. So everything we do, whether it's policy, whether it's a political party, whether it's a group uh, uh, of advocacy, uh, whether it's, it's a, a policy program, uh, it should pose this question, whether the outcome is really one that embraces all concerned in a way that upholds life, in a way that enhances life in a way that en enhances security, in a way that enhances peace. Uh, that's how love, love uh, becomes transformative. So love is a responsibility um, towards our fellow human. And it's uh, sometimes we're, we're, if you, and because love in its essence is giving, love is generous. Love is not selfish. And I think when we are stuck in our ideologies and we refuse to listen and we, we, we are not giving, we, we're not being generous, we're, we're selfish. We, we want to just be in our bubble. We can't see beyond our own concern and love is considerate. And so when we operate with, with love in times of tension, I think we, we can uh, be of help to reduce it. Um, and we are in, when we are intentional about it, when we approach a difficult conversation with love, or when we approach a different uh, ideology with love, um, I think we perceive it and we interact with it differently. You agree? Yes, sir. Uh, I would say yes, very true. Um, you know, the, the issue of uh, selfishness and narcissism is really very important because uh, 
narcissism and selfishness arise you know when we do live under conditions of fear and insecurity and vulnerability uh, in the in the settings in which we live uh, but the you know to 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 project love in a, in a caring way and in an indiscriminate way again can create space it creates those spaces which are necessary to seriously address challenges and to seriously transform and reform uh, and uh, and forge you know policies and shift cultures because cult cultures and beliefs also need to shift you know we you know there is a side to our cultural references and values that we preserve but there is also the need for for new more values and new values uh, that are relevant to the times we live in and that is also important but one thing we should remember about love as a wise person said it's the only thing that the more you give the more you have everything else when you give it diminishes uh, in in giving in loving ways you have more you don't have less and that's oh, something to be remembered that's a beautiful note uh, to end at um, and um, it was just a fabulous conversation Harry I, I really appreciate uh, your uh, sharing and your generosity of analysis and thoughts and stories um, it's a really much needed conversation at times where people can't even um, people feel paralyzed feel they don't know what to do. It's the pandemic. There's the pandemic fatigue. Um, that's a new phenomenon now that, you know, people are struggling with the pandemic. And I like what you shared with me over uh, our conversations about finding our land, like the island, how, how you deal with the pandemic. Do you want to share that with our, um, with our guests yeah. uh, as, a, as, a, as an advice going forward? Uh, uh Okay. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, a tr it's a time of, uh, it's almost surreal what we're going through, really. Uh, things have shut down, you know, we, we become vulnerable to each other. We're supposed to remain at a distance from each other. Uh, this is unheard of. It's as though we have become each other's enemy without really intending to. Uh, there is anxiety about whether we will have a vaccine or not. And I really, you know, hope and pray that we do because that can be a huge uh, exit path from, uh, you know, the malaise that we are engulfed in. But I think the fact that uh, the pandemic has slowed everything down because it really put the world on pause. Yeah especially the high speed world in which we used to live because speed and interconnectivity um, turned life into a gushing river with no stop. So now we have this terrible pandemic, but we also have the opportunity to become more reflective. It's really a time of reflection. Uh, it's a time of acknowledging how life is fragile. It's a time of acknowledging that a lot of problems are, are wait for solutions. And I assure you that most of the problems that are now in the middle of all these conflicts will not be addressed. It's impossible to address them under the pandemic conditions. But under the current conditions, we have a huge opportunity to prepare for what we are going to do when the pandemic is over. So it, it's as though we are challenged to put everything on pause. We are challenged to reflect on the world that we build so far and whether that world is viable for all. For some, it has been a great world. For some, it has been the American dream but for others it has been the American nightmare. And both are, are true, both are realities, and both have to be acknowledged. But we need to move forward uh, with the determination that some things need to be addressed, many things rather need to be addressed. So the pandemic, uh, I try to survive the pandemic by assuming that the pandemic has put me on an island a very little island, which is as big as my house. And 
the reason why I'm now there is to become more reflective. Uh, it's a time of uh, soul searching. It's a time where uh, we have shut everything down except uh, our heart and our minds. Uh, they keep working. So it's a crisis, but it's also an occasion uh, to reflect at deeper levels that our fast paced world didn't allow us to. And also be aware of cyberspace. It's a very ambiguous space. There's all sorts of wonderful things and horrible things in cyberspace. Uh, because yet another challenge is to return to truth. Because we used to say that uh, you speak truth to power. Uh, now it has become the reverse. You know, power decides on the truth. And a lot of people are into that. You know, it's not what is true. It's, it's what narrative helps me gain an advantage on the enemy. That becomes far more significant, far more important than whether or not uh, what I perceive, what I state is true. Uh, that too can change if relationships improve because in improving relationships, truth expands and broadens. Uh, and maybe at this point, it may make sense to refer to the, uh, the four-way test, which is really uh, you know, a, a guiding uh, four-part directive of Rotary, uh, because it may be helpful to help us make sense of what is going on. And as you know, the first one is uh, what is the truth? Well, at this stage, given the divisions and the fragmentation we have, it's important to, uh, to attend and try to ascertain what, uh, what the truths are and whether the truths that each side or each group uh, upholds uh, are legitimate or not. Uh, but there are multiple truths and not one side has a monopoly on it. In fact, today we have a lot of fragmented truths. Truth has broken into a lot of pieces and it has also combined with a lot of untruths. Uh, that's why yeah, some say we live in a post-truth way because uh, we get our knowledge and our information from cyberspace but in there you find anything you want. You can, you can upload anything you want. Uh, it's anything goes which is the downside of you know, what we call post-modernity. But if we pose this question, what is the truth in a genuine way, in a caring way, in a loving way, it would lead us to understand at a deeper level. And is it fair to all concerned? This is the second one. This, I think, addresses issues of justice. Is it fair to all concerned? Is what is happening fair to all concerned? Uh, is it fair to all concerned when things burn down? Is it fair to all concerned when citizens uh, get shot? Is it fair to all concern when policies A, B, or C are on the table? Uh, we have to expand those directives. They're not, just, they're not just personalistic. They have implications for society. And will it build goodwill and better friendship? I think this is the relational part of uh, the four-way test of Rosary. In other words, the pursuit is to address truths and fairness in a way that improves the relationships. That's what friendship here implies. And of course, the last one is, you know, will it, will it be beneficial to all concerned? It's the outcome. It's the outcome of seeking the truth and seeking fairness and improving relationships. You get outcomes which are rich and outcomes that can be shared and outcomes that are positive and life enhancing. So the four-way test of Rotary has uh, far greater implications than just uh, how we apply them individually. Thank you, Harry. That's a great uh, wrap up of the conversation. Uh, I really wanna thank Hassan, uh, Saran, Susan, Tom, and William for sticking uh, around and listening to our extended conversation. I appreciate you all, Harry. Thank you so much. I wish you a happy Friday and a great uh, rest of your weekend.
um, have and thank you so much for for being part of this uh, together for peace. It was really an honor to have you and listen to your thoughts. And thank you for the invitation. It has been okay. delightful, and uh, I hope it made some sense. It, yeah, we definitely are less confused. <laughs> Good. <laughs> thank you, Harry. Have, okay. have a good day, everybody. Bye. Bye for now. Bye, everyone.